Okay, we are now live. Um, welcome everybody to the webinar. Welcome to the webinar on the uh, uh, of the ASEAN Regional Coalition to Stop Digital Dictatorship. Um, and our topic this uh, this evening is Myanmar's digital coup. What can we do to resist? We are extremely fortunate to have a diverse and distinguished and exciting um, list of speakers today, and um, including friends who are joining us from Myanmar. Despite the restrictions that are happening, we, we look very, we are very, very uh, excited and keen to hear what they have to share with us. My name is Debbie Stothart. I'm your moderator and um, coordinator of Altsian Burma, which is one of the uh, members of the ASEAN Regional Coalition to Stop Digital Dictatorship. And this webinar is being hosted by Manusia Foundation. Officially, it's co-hosted by Altsian, but we just turn up. They do all the heavy work. All right. Um, um, for friends who are joining us by Facebook Live, please don't hesitate to type in your questions and comments. Someone is monitoring it and will forward your questions to me later on. First up, um, I'm going to introduce to you Tinza Shunle Yi, an anti-coup activist, a youth ad advocate, and a feminist. Tinza has taken time out from the street rallies that um, have been raging in Yangon uh, to speak with us. So Tinza, thank you very much for joining us from Yangon. And I just wanted to ask you, what are the latest, latest digital restrictions, the restrictions on young people resisting the coup? And um, how are the youth activists and the movement um, dealing with these restrictions. Over to you, Tinza. And you have only Thank a few you. minutes, unfortunately. Thank you, Debbie, um, and the organizer. Uh, this is a, such a crucial time that um, thanks for organizing this, and we need to be hard, especially in this time. So um, as you all know, the, the uprising is on the way, and um, also uh, we have daily protest every day. At the same time, the gender already imposed uh, the curfew online and offline. So we have a digital curfew um, every day in a row right now for three days um, uh, from uh, 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. every day. It's almost every day now. At the same time, there is a um, band, uh, there is a Facebook band, um, a Twitter and Instagram, you know, so we can assess now without VVN. Now all of us are using VVN. We have to install, even my mom just installed VVN and she is so um, frustrated with these, you know, using these. At the same time, for me, for myself, and for all of us, we have to struggle a lot with these digital devices. We all have that um, mobile devices, but we don't really know how to use them. Um, you know, long time ago, since long time ago, we were just introduced uh, to use the devices, but not how to use them, or how that can be uh, dangerous to us. We've been giving out all the information, but even right now, I don't see, even activists among ourselves, we don't have enough um, awareness about the digital security. And even among the Generation Z, the same, the same thing happened. There are many companies running, giving out. Um, also, there are many different, you know, initiation, like um, uh, different apps for this protest, for these protests. But at the same time, we don't know how they will ensure our security and stuff. And young people are just using them and just use these uh, tools to mobilize people and et cetera. So anything can happen to them. So when there is a agenda, you know, they impose um, uh, different laws and different restrictions different orders, um, they changed the, um, they have recently introduced a cyber security law. Also, they changed different law, like including PNAC code that can jail up to 10 years, more than 10 years. So also many people have been outlawed at the same time. And now currently we have uh, uh, nearly 500 prisoner, political prisoner, being detained since February 1st. Even before that, as of December 20. 2020, we have um, um, nearly 600 uh, political prisoners already. So uh, the detainment, the arrestment is, um, is, on, is on the way, it's happening right now. 
So when they we say uh, a coup, a coup came in, in a package, a package of oppression, a package of restriction, our restricting our freedom of speech, not just online, but also offline as well. They are violent crackdown. So the coup is, um, when we say coup is, we, we, we say um, it's a dictatorship. Also, we need to be aware that this is also a clearly a, um, a, a coup in the digital platform as well. It clearly a dictatorship in our digital, digital life as well. So, so I want to um, uh, encourage our friends to raise awareness about the digital security as much as you we, you can. We need to flood you know our timeline uh, on Facebook or Twitter with the use how to utilize our digital tools, how to be securely mobilizing our protests. I think this is what is needed right now. At the same time, we need to hold whole accountable of the social media. As you see, uh, as the military uh, uh, spread out their propaganda, they are freely running their information, misinformation, disinformation on social media, on those platforms, not just Facebook, but Twitter, but also TikTok, but also Viber. We need to make sure we are pushing them to hold accountable with all these fake news, all the propaganda spreading around. I'm uh, super worried about that because, you know, they can use these um, fake news to instigate the religious tension and ethnic tension. It's, I can foresee that. So we need to stop um, you know, we need to stop the happening. And I think social media, the role of social media play a huge role here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dinza, for that very intensive and concise uh, wrap up. So we, besides the new cybersecurity law, the, the junta has actually um, amended the penal code and the criminal code uh, to impose higher penalties and also this very loose description of um, even if you criticize the military or even if you call it a military regime, um, you could actually be charged. So um, despite that, there's a very strong sense of um, resistance, a very strong, strong sense of defiance, mm -hmm. and even mothers and aunties are signing up to VPN. So that cannot be a bad thing. Um, thank you so much, uh, Tinza. Our next speaker is Kosuei Win, um, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Myanmar Now, and winner of the very prestigious Maxese Award, which is often considered the Southeast, A Southeast Asian Nobel Peace Prize, is a, a hard-hitting um, investigative journalist and one of the first courageous independent media to face off with Wiratu, the ultra-nationalist mark. Um, Koswe would you, uh, Koswe is joining us from a secret location because of security reasons. Um, and um, Koswe Win, would you like to share what's happening now for your colleagues uh, at Myanmar now? Uh, how are you able to do your work? And uh, what does this, what, what are your other colleagues in other media organizations facing? Please go ahead, Koswe Win. Please unmute. Koswe Win, please unmute. Uh, thank you, Debbie, for the invitation. Uh, we have been actively covering the coup and the aftermath of the coup. Uh, though all of us are living and working uh, in fear uh, on a day to day basis, as, uh, we are looking forward uh, to the moment when the full blown assault where fall on us. Uh, so the regime is uh, re-establishing a full-fledged police state. So we are enjoying just a brief uh, a winter period, winter period. So the regime has so many enemies, so many uh, opposition groups, uh, to deal with, uh, and in the meantime, uh, I think they have the policies that uh, they wouldn't touch the media immediately, but there is every indication they have shown over the past week that uh, they go, going to go after the media sooner or later. So the, the, 
the Ministry of Information and the, and the regime has issued a, a statement very recently that, you know, uh, the media should not call them a military junta or coup regime or anything like that, you know? Uh, we have to call them by their former name, State Administrative Council. We won't, we won't comply. We won't comply. We won't comply. Even if all the operation, all our operation have to be shut down, we can't even accept the justification that, okay, let's use this name and then let's continue to give important coverage, you know, let's do continue to do all this important coverage in this critical time. We won't even assert, assert it. In any, in any sphere, the spirituality of our work is more important than anything. We won't even uh, concede uh, to such a usage uh, in, our, in our reporting. So you can imagine, you know, how intense uh, uh, the situation is uh, we are faced with. So uh, back to the question actually of how this, uh, how this coup has impacted the media on the ground, including Myanmar now. It has initially disrupted the state, uh, continues to disrupt a lot of our work uh, because of the internet blackout, because of the, uh, because of the, the potential assault on us anytime. Even before the cook, uh, there were rumors flying on the social media that uh, we will be attacked. You know, we are at the top of the hate list. You know, we saw a hate, a list of individuals and organizations which will be attacked. And now we found out that this hate list turned out to be authentic. Many of the individuals on the hate list were thrown into jail in the early hours of uh, February 1st when the coup was launched. So we are even being threatened, you know, before the coup. And also we are the only news organization uh, uh, which, uh, which wrote a you know, story that a coup was going to be launched within 72 hours. We wrote that story on January 28th. Uh, we reported that Aung San Suu Kyi and all the top political leaders would be detained by the military. So we, we, we have started evacuating our newsroom since January 28th, even uh, after, just after uh, our story was uh, published. So, so we are, we've been in a very difficult uh, environment at Amtina. I don't want to go into details uh, for the safety of, uh, for the sake of the safety of our colleagues, but this has disrupted a lot actually our news operation and uh, also that of many other uh, uh, news outlet, new, new news outlet, I would say. So, and again, the main challenge we cannot tackle with is the big time information warfare. This is the premeditated, uh, uh, carefully planned information warfare was launched by the regime uh, since the run up to the cook. And that this information warfare is continuing. For example, uh, past, uh, 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 in, my case, in my own case, you know, there were a lot of rumors that I was already detained, you know, on the day of the coup, you know? So whatever news the Manam produced should not be taken as true because our, you know, our, our website has already been under the control of the regime. So that's sort of, you know, uh, that's sort of propaganda at you all. And also on the uh, fourth or fifth day after the coup, you know, uh, there were news that at you all, on the, uh, there were news that Aung San Suu Kyi was already released. Some people went out to the streets to celebrate, you know, the release of uh, her release and lit the firecrackers, you know, even in the sky, etc. Who did, who launched this information warfare, Jewali? 
we can easily know, you know, uh, who, are, who are doing it actually. And also another, you know, quite popular uh, fake news, part of the information warfare, uh, separate very quickly, it is that if the people keep quiet within 72 hours after the coup, you know, then the new, the new regime, you know, would be automatically illegitimate. So people should not go out to the street, you know, to make chaos or to make protests that you want, you know? So all these, you know, uh, all these rumors are part of the big time coordinated information warfare, which none of the established media outlet domestically and internationally ha had not touched at all, actually. But, but it's a, it, it is a quite a difficult journey, actually, you know? Uh, like members of the public, the media personnel have been traumatized. We still remain speechless. We are dealing with the trauma, yeah. the mental injury. The mental, it's like, for example, uh, it's like 22 decades of military rule were thrown at our, at our face, you know? For example, I lived seven years in jail at New Orleans, you know? So like, it, uh, in my case, seven years of prison confinement were thrown to me, you know, on the day of the coup. Every moment, every bitter moment I passed through, now came back to me, you know? So we, we all are dealing with this trauma, you know? Not just the media, not just the media personnel, the entire population. For example, I want to write a number of news stories and analysis. I have a lot to write at Uwali, but I could not put into words because of the mental injury I am still uh, dealing with. For example, I don't I'm, I feel very, very emotional about the bravery of youth like Tenza and you know her generation that you worry. But you know. I feel very actually concerned about their safety, you know, how they will survive in prison, you know, how they will survive, how they will deal with the torture, mental torture, physical torture, you know, how many years of their youth they are going to lose in a prison confinement, et cetera, you know? So I want to write things, but I, I got to be careful, you know? I don't want to, I don't want to provoke them. You know, if they do it off their own freeway, that's good enough, you know? So a lot of challenges, as you worry, we are dealing with, you know? For example, uh, I made a historical decision, as you worry, am I news wrong? If you, if you report, you do the reporting, but if you are off the duty, you have all the right to express your opinion, by any form, by any nonviolent form, you know, many, many people in the in the media circle will not accept my 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 decision that you want, you know. But you know, we are we are members of the humanity, you know. We go to the pagoda, we go to the mosque, you know. We practice our own separate belief. You know, we have many forms that you want. At the same time, you know, that's why, uh, you know. I got to, I got to resolve the outrage of our our team members, even though if they are reporters that you were, you know, they are they are dealing with the outrage. They cannot write properly at you were. They cannot write their stories, you know, with the outrage. So they need to let out. They need to vent, you know, their fury at you were, in a legitimate and nonviolent way. So we are. Oh, we, uh, we are dealing actually with the disruption created by the regime. We are also dealing with the mental trauma. Why at the same time, we are trying to deliver important news and information uh, to the public. Thank you very much. I don't want to talk more actually. Thank you, Ko Sui Win. Um, I'm gonna ask you to mute now. Um, um, thank you very much for that um, 
very uh, unexpected. I really did not expect you to be so soulfully honest um, to share this feeling of vulnerability, but also this mix of fury and trauma and principle of, of the fact that members of the media, such as yourself, are also traumatized and trying to do their work to sp speak truth to power at the same time. Um, and now I understand why you won the Southeast Asian Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> after hearing your, after, after, after you've shared this. Um, I now would like to go to, to, to give the floor to Dr. Matida. So Dr. Matida and I are kind of like the oldies. Um, um, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Matida was started in the movement, was first arrested and detained at a time in Myanmar, Burma's history, where people were actually jailed for unauthorized use of fax machines. I think most of our um, audience, and I think at least half of our speakers are too young to remember fax machines. But I remember the story of Uncle Leo Nichols dying in, uh, in detention, dying in custody because he was jailed for um, unauthorized use of a fax machine. So Dr. Matida, you um, are a member of, a board member of Penn International and a member of Penn Myanmar. Um, you have seen everything that has happened in um, over 30 years in, uh, in, this, in this ongoing struggle for human rights and democracy. Um, what do you think could be the solutions? What are your ideas in terms of how we deal this double war, this um, attack on uh, digital rights of um, ordinary people and activists and this well-coordinated info warfare by the regime that started even before the coup happened? Over to you, Dr. Matida. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Manusha. And uh, compared to 88, I think uh, technologies now turn out to be a common weapon used by both the hunter and the people, you know. So in 1988, at that time, we still don't have yet the cell phone. At that time, we just rely on a line phone. So the, to organize such a big protest is such a difficult, but right now it's easier, relatively easier, even though they ban the social media and the internet. So I think the digital dictatorship is uh, literally not very successful because you all right now uh, notice about there are so many ways to combat it. You know, right now, a lot of people use not only VPN, but also the SIM card from Thailand. And also the global hackers are helping us spreading the information, something like that. So the, this, the uh, handling with the technology and the information handling from the both sides, it's a uh, pretty much uh, very, uh, effective and sensitive, you know, right now. That's why the, the making the report to the MRTV and the Miawari Facebook pages has been pretty much successful. The, the hacking their pages is pretty much successful. That's why I think they cannot just simply shut down the internet for 24 seven, because they also need to rely on this uh, platform to distribute their uh, misinformation and disinformation, something like that, you know. So I think uh, compared to 88, what we having now is the legitimacy, you know. In, in 1988, we really don't have any legitimacy yet. We just against the current government, something like that. Right now, the haunter has no legitimacy, but from the people's side, we have strong legitimacy, the election results and things. So I think the international community also needs to acknowledge and work together with people based on this legitimacy. It's the easiest and most uh, shortest way 
to change the results. Uh, that that's the uh, our biggest strength is right now is the legitimacy. So uh, of course we do have so many uh, dreams to come true. So even though there is a uh, restrictions and the dictatorship and the digital platform, we still try to use it. For example, like now having the webinar with us, you know, so there, there are still ways <laughs> to overcome it or to combat it. So that's why I think the good things about is the Generation Z and the youth, they are the uh, netizens, you know, <laughs> they are the global citizens. For that reason, I think the current protest, it's not easily break down. And compared to 88, we most mainly rely on a group of people as a leaders, the, the uh, selective leadership right now is more on the collective leadership. That's why I think the uh, also the international community also having this kind of thing, the according to the uh, security resolution, it sounds like unanimous uh, agreement is making the peer pressure on the international level, each other on particular uh, countries like China and Russia is effective. So it's more like collective leadership on the community, uh, international community. At the same time, the collective leadership in the ground. And then this kind of uh, collective leadership plus the strong legitimacy can walk together. Then we will overcome easily. That's my point. Uh, I, I, that's my way of thinking. Thank you. I think Debbie is still missing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matilda. Yeah, Debbie, Debbie is joining back. She got a quick um, internet issue. She's joining again. Hi, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, um, we had an internet problem and we are not in Myanmar, so I don't understand. <laughs> Please continue, Dr. Matida. I'm so sorry. Uh, no, I, uh, I think, yeah, uh, if I need to say there are several things I, I, I would like to say, but right now I think I'm so happy with the current protest, even though it's a pretty much vulnerable according to my experience. It might be ended in uh, any ways, you know, this is kind of the more open protest, you know. <laughs> That's why I think I still reflect my words. We are still on at the fog in the road, you know. I had been writing this book, the, my, my book, The Roadmap, the end, last chapter, it's the title is Fog in the Road. It was for the 2010, even though the the, uh, the election having done in 2010, I keep saying this, we are not on the right track. We are still at the fork in the road. And this is the proof, the coup had proved this. We are still at the fork in the road. That's why I think the people of Myanmar and the international community working together and choosing the right way because we are still not on the uh, the destiny nor on the dry track yet. So now everybody learned about the weakness of the constitution, including themselves, including the army. <laughs> because of that, the, the, this kind of coup had happened. It's, they are in dilemma right now, even though they say, oh, we do according to the constitution, we do according to the uh, existing law, they are not. We have so many proofs already. That's why they try to, uh, Red, uh, amend the uh, law, not just the cyber security law, uh, for example, like the penal code to one to one, etc. So that's me, even though they make several other kinds of the legal, uh, illegitimate legal preparation, they are still yet not uh, safe under this kind of the con uh, current constitution and the existing law. So their fear makes that that kind of dictatorship. That's why I think even for the digital dictatorship, it won't be successful. You know. Okay. Thank you so much. 
So Dr. Matt uh, Tida is um, telling us, taking a more positive spin on the situation um, uh, based on decades of experience. She's seeing that the battlefield is a little bit more level, especially when it comes to the digital space, because our Generation Z leaders um, and hackers and um, activists are finding ways and means to fight back using the digital space despite the attempts to restrict it. So we are caught in a, a, a struggle um, which which is ongoing and also very inspiring. So um, um, very, very positive note. I'm going to now move on to Tinti Neo. Now, Tinti Neo um, had worked for many years in the women's movement and um, with her kick-ass feminism, um, put the fear of uh, human rights in a lot of people and spoke truth to power. And now she is the managing director of BNI Multimedia Group, an alliance of 16 independent media outlets, which are mostly um, ethnic-based. So many of her members are often the, the main sources of information for Myanmar's diverse ethnic communities. Tintin Neo, I'm aware you've spoken to uh, you've spoken previously on other at other events about the uphill, uphill struggles that members of your multimedia group have been facing in the lead up to the, the elections in November 2020. What is the situation now that the coup has happened? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Debbie. And also thank you so much to Manusha for organizing this very important event and also giving us the voice to share what is going on on the ground uh, regarding the role of the media uh, during this uh, situation the, under the military coup. So it is very, how to say, um, <clears throat> unfortunate that our generation need to witness again for this uh, kind of military coup. Although we know that the democratic transition was not genuine, but we were expecting that the military will not seize the power again because they already got the legitimacy from the 2008 constitution and they have all the powers. So anyway, this happened again, it's very unfortunate, but at the same time, it is fortunate too, because I witnessed the power of the people. So this is the time that people really show their solidarity. And this is the time that people are actually united under the military coup. So they know so well that who is their enemy, what system they have to abolish. So I appreciate that I witnessed that too. And also like uh, we talk about the digital things. So this is like uh, the area which is very, uh, not very familiar for me as well. I have to struggle a lot. I'm lucky that I stay in Thailand so I don't have to uh, go through all the digital processes, but I'm very hard to say um, inspired with all the people who are trying to overcome all the restrictions they have been through. So now I'm going to talk about, you know, um, our members, BNI members uh, situation under the military coup. Uh, as uh, we are aware, even under the so-called Reddit rule, media has never been, they has always been the target and they has always been prosecuted and they has always been assaulted, threatened, intimidated, but now, what is the difference? It's worse to say simply. Because like, um, uh, and under the military rule, it is so natural and normal that they like to control every person's life. And that is most importantly, they would like to control the media because media is the one that is playing a very important uh, platform, informing, messaging, to the people, to the political uh, policy cycle. So that's what the media is doing. So among ourselves, we analyzed that as soon as the military coup happened, 
we said that, okay, we lost our, um, our freedom of speech and freedom of expression and also access to information. So that's what we lost completely. And also like uh, the role of the media is to help to create, develop, broaden for greater space in the country. Then we lost it now. So that is our analysis of the, as soon as the coup happened. So now it's like, um, of course, um, we uh, reporting, news reporting on the ground become very difficult. Of course, partly because of the uh, internet interruption, shutdown, and also like a data control, all those things happen. And then that also really like a delay. And then also like, um, it is so difficult to, uh, uh, how do you say, um, for the community uh, journalists, or we can say like an informant, they, this time they are not uh, there to provide information to the different ethnic media outlets. And then also they don't want to speak out and, and then few and few people we can access to. And also like uh, they, uh, many people started to refuse speaking and also interview. So this become very difficult uh, for the like um, media to uphold the quality of the news and also the balance of the news. So that is one of one, uh, th these are like uh, the, uh, more of the challenges that our members are facing on the ground. And also like, um, and also it seems like it, it, is, it is like obvious that the uh, current military uh, regime is trying to restrict uh, the freedom of um, the media using the words that, that they're supposed to use. For example, like uh, Coach Wei also mentioned about, you know, the orders coming from the, you know, the information department. Uh, you know, we also received um, the letters. Some of the members, they received the letter saying that we shouldn't use, and say the word like uh, the coup uh, administration or, you know, the, we have to use the word, the name that is officially, uh, how do you say, permitted. Uh, by the military coup. But for us, it's like, um, you know, members, they are saying that since we are uh, announcing ourselves in independent media groups, so and position, so we cannot, I want to say, follow or comply with whatever, uh, how do you say, uh, whatever orders coming from the military regime. So, so that, but, but of course, uh, by refusing to do so, there will be lots of, uh, how to say, threat, and also like uh, many, uh, how to say, an expected situation can happen, maybe arrest, or maybe, you know, completely uh, shut down our media groups. So all these things can, uh, can, can happen to our uh, members. And then at the same time, uh, our members are doing the live streaming, to every uh, anti-coup demonstration. So uh, some of that, like, uh, you know, they were in the front lines and they got some injuries. And because like, um, uh, they do not have, uh, how do you say, um, good protection equipment when they are doing live streamings. And also there are lots of demands from the people to do the live streaming, uh, you know, close up or like that. So without, you know, equipment, they have to do the close up. So they got endure. And some of them were beaten because of the, you know, uh, for the reporting. And then one of the reporters phone was disposed. And, you know, so, so these, these things are happening. Although um, the military regime has not targeted to the media group yet, but there are, you know, many restrictions, many life-threatening things. And they, like, uh, even like uh, uh, two, uh, a few days ago, in Mietina, you know, during the, during the, uh, covering the, you know, the protest um, uh, demanding the uh, soldiers to leave from the power plant, and then uh, fight off the I follow up with them. Uh, I follow, follow up through our connection, how they were released, why it is, it seemed like it's quite easy for them to be released. So, but I, I think there are some like, uh, uh, how to say, promise that they have to make, there are some, some of the like agreement they have to sign. 
So one is from the police. That is about the, the, the Adiga 144, you know, the curfew, because like uh, they, they were doing the reporting uh, during the curfew times. That's why, uh, the, you know, they have to sign for that for the police. But for the soldier, it's like um, they ask these people not to write like uh, some kind of provocative uh, writing news. So, uh, uh, you know, they kind of trying to uh, restrict uh, and then, you know, this kind of things. But, but the reporters were brave enough that they didn't sign it, but they, they were still released. So, I mean, like we are very happy, but uh, we also worry that, um, uh, because these this, uh, reporters, as soon as they release, they continue to do the reporting again. So we don't know what will happen in the near future. So they're like uh, all the crackdown, the reporter were part of it, inside it. They were trapped up. They were like, um, they have to face with all the like, uh, you know, shooting and also tear gas and the water canal firing. So I, I mean like, um, but this time is like, uh, you know, the Myanmar press council is also no longer stabilized at all. You know, there are many uh, resigned from the Myanmar Press Council. Although the Myanmar Press Council one was not strong enough to protect the journalists, even in the past, but at the times, journalists have a place to turn to, although they did not get fully uh, uh, protection. But this time, um, we can see that there, would, there wouldn't be, uh, how do you say, Myanmar Press Council anymore. It may be like that. So in that case, we don't know where that, uh, where and who and whose institution that you know the journalists and the media house can turn to. So we are on our own, like together with the people, of course. Yes. Thank you, Tintin. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you. Thank you for sharing um, this very real and on the ground updates on what what um, journalists are doing and being how they are being caught. Uh, in in trying to fulfill their duties to report from the ground, and also that um, um, the the one one of the institutions for to which um, the media could depend on for advocacy and support, the Myanmar Press Council has been decimated um, by the coup. So one of the um, we've come to the end of our main speaker list, but I, I noticed, I just wanted to feedback that there are about 200 um, uh, people watching this webinar on Facebook Live and on Zoom. Um, and we are getting greetings of solidarity from friends, some of you who you might know personally, um, um, from Asia, all around Asia, from Europe. And I think there's someone from the US that means um, she's staying up uh, she got up really early or is staying up really late to be able to join this webinar. So um, welcome to everybody. Um, for those who've just joined, this is the um, ASEAN Regional Coalition to Stop Digital Dictatorships um, webinar on Myanmar's digital coup. What can we do to resist? We have some, um, we've had, we've just heard from some amazing speakers. Um, from Myanmar and um, from neighboring countries. Um, I just, before we go into the next part of this session, I just wanted to read out some of uh, the questions. Um, and I think I'm going to ask the first one of Tinza Shunle. Um, for Eleanor, Eleanor Getty asks Is there a document in Burmese language which explains? in simple non-technical language, how to install VPN and how to navigate safely online in Myanmar. I would like to share with a network of 22,000 rural women in Myanmar, thank you. At the same time, July Mo um, says, promotion of education on the use of digital platform, especially social media should be done as fast as possible and as much as we can to reduce false information and spreading of fake news, but how? Um, um, Tinza Shunle, are you going to offer your mother uh, to teach us or teach everybody how to put on a VPN and be more safe digitally? Or is there a handy resource that you would like to recommend? Um, yeah, th thanks for the question. Um, I was thinking like if my mom could be a teacher to her neighbors because she lives in a monastery right now. And I think it's not possible right now because 
she cannot use she don't know she's she simply just reject everything like she can't stop those kind of complications digital complications and i think uh, the best way is to teach to inform to the younger people the younger people are always curious with all these devices they were brought up with that so they are clever so if they if we show them one way and it will definitely spread out to their communities for example when they start uh, banning facebook i start seeing uh, a voluntary service center in different streets like um, they just say free bpn free bpn service so people just installing these bpn the point is um, free BBN is not safe at all. And I, they need to pay for the paid BBN. So we need more codes, you know, to spread out, especially to those on the front line um, in the streets, because there are different leaders in each street. Um, yeah, so uh, especially for those who are doing um, CDM strikes, who are joining in CDM strikes. And uh, I want you all to know that, you know, this uprising is, is different. As, as you all are aware, it is leaderless. I mean, not just we're not just following one group or single people. You know, we are doing our own thing in different ways, in different initiatives. So we need to make sure everything we are delivering, a message we are sending out should be in the uh, grassroots base. You know, it should be in, it should be organic so that they can just spread out to their community. And these communities are always ready. And I think I'm really thankful to the civil society who are working closely with the grassroots community so that now they all are quite prepared, you know, to stand up for their rights. And now they can, like, for example, my organization, ACDD, we have a uh, grassroots community, we have grassroots network across 12, uh, nine states and regions. So now they are ready to help their community in different ways. Digital security, also with the, with the protest tactic, you know, how to mobilize other people, how to organize people. Um, so I think there are many other groups out there, especially in ethnic areas. We just have to help them what they needed and they can just decimate it. It's so easy right now, but the point is you know we need to go in person uh, for these information we just spread out online if they don't assess facebook they will never know that if we are spreading just online so we need to go in person now many people print out they just they are using email to send documents so that the other person in the other states and region they print and print them out and they deliver they just you know spread it out in different even to homes to home bases they keep information, you know, rolling. Sometimes I'm so amazed. Um, even we don't know what's going on at like around um, at 1, 8, 1 p.m. They just clap their hands. Why, why we are having internet blackout? You know, they are clapping their hands and I don't know how they get that message, how to collectively clap their hands in that. And they are saying we are clapping in, in favor of the parliament committee being formed they are holding sessions so we are clapping hands and i don't even get that information and they are getting so i'm so amazed by this community-led communication so these communication mechanisms are really strong we just have to strengthen them thank you thank you so much tinza now before we go on to um our panel of reactors um one there's one more question that i want to share with all the speakers for now from uh, myanmar and then um and then um we will um have some reactors and then deal with some of the questions but one of the other questions was about the vpn and understanding how to protect yourself uh, digitally dr matida has also shared the li a link for vpn i just wanted to Debbie, you are muted. You are muted. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry about that. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, before we go into um, the next the next section, I wanted to um, share. Dr. Matida has um, shared um, the VPN, and so has Raman on here. But also, there is um, a resource in, in Burmese language at www.protestos, P R O T E S T O S dot O R G. And that, and someone else has kindly also shared that on the Facebook Live chat. Um, um, the big question that I think um, 
friends who are joining us from around the world, including Norway, I got a, we, we, got, we got a hello from Norway, um, is what are the biggest needs and how can international donors help activists and journalists on the ground? Um, uh, uh, Tinza shared a very important point that uh, the activists need to be able to access more than just a free VPN, even though um, there are help stations in the civil disobedience movement in every street trying to encourage protesters and activists to improve their digital security. Um, Tinza is actually saying put out more codes, um, buy more VPN and share it so that more people can use a safer VPN. Um, I'm going to now go uh, to Kosue Win. I hope he's still around. Kosue Win, the question is what are, how can international donors help activists and journalists um, in this situation? I think, yeah, you know, I will, both journalists and activists actually uh, definitely need uh, technological support actually, you know? So uh, I don't want to specify what kind of support, you know, uh, we need, but we do need actually, you know? And also for the broader public actually, you know, uh, if the, global tech companies, you know, can figure out uh, ways and means actually, you know, to have uh, this oppressed public access to information, you know, so all, all of these initiatives uh, would be very useful. So whatever has been initiated in Hong Kong or in Thailand uh, came to use actually has come to be useful actually, you know, for the protesters in Myanmar. So likewise, uh, you know, if we can figure out something actually, you know, in the Myanmar contest, that were that can very useful actually, you know, for similar situations. Uh, as far as I know, uh, uh, both uh, in Hong Kong or in Thailand, uh, do not uh, did, did not suffer from this kind of uh, internet blackout. You know, so it's quite unique uh, in this country. Also, uh, you know, we use, uh, 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 we use, people have started using some of the applications that Hong Kong, the Hong Kong you used, you know, uh, over the past few years, actually. Uh, but I think uh, there should be, actually, you know, uh, much more easier actually, you know, applications or methods actually for us to communicate with each other uh, in the event of, you know, major internet blackout. So, yeah, I think so actually, you know. Thank you, Ko Sui Wen. Um, so um, it looks like the Milk Tea Alliance is at work. People have been learning from each other, from movements in uh, Hong Kong, even in Thailand and Taiwan, uh, on how to bypass and how to resist dic digital dictatorship. Um, and and Kosui Win is calling for greater global technical support. Um, Dr. Matida, besides helping me remember that I'm muted, um, what do you think um, international donors should be doing? Well, yeah, just the technological assistance is pretty much uh, important. And also the, uh, not just like the codes for VPN, but also uh, like the um, uh, training how to do. And I think the, there should be the, not a larger scale, but for the smaller group uh, kind of the information exchange group, it should be thoroughly founded with the help of the international uh, uh, assistance, the technology and other, that would be very helpful to make an exchange, not just through the internet, but also through, for example, like Bluetooth, 
briefly something like that how to use it properly and also right now we are also using sort of the walkie talkie uh, application <laughs> so for making sure the safety in a quarter so the the people also connected each other, especially at night and putting on that application and talking each other what's going on outside of your home so we can cooperate each other, something like that. That kind of uh, assistance can be also done uh, for the international community on that level. But also I think the, the spreading uh, the the real information on behalf of us to the war that can also be done from your end you know keep an eye on our situation especially uh, at midnight but beyond midnight since majority of us cannot be active on digital platform you all can do and you all uh, if someone still can spread the the file or the information you all can spreading it aggressively otherwise most of us normally do before the 1 a.m something like that but up, up beyond 1 a.m we cannot do it. then you can also help us and making your uh, also uh, network together and uh, some sort of the uh, uh, collective activities on uh, spreading the information will be also helpful, I think. Thank you, Dr. Matida. How about you, Tintinio? What do you think uh, donors should be doing for um, for uh, the 16 media uh, organizations of BNI and the broader movement? Thank you so much. I also want to like uh, support what uh, uh, Sema Matida has said and also Kusiwe and other. Uh, one of the most important thing is like, uh, you know, the international communities uh, 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 keep watching uh, what is going on in our country and then also do the coverage of our situation as well. And also like, uh, I would like to see that the international, regional and international media groups uh, connect with our local media. I mean, local media is including our ethnic media, those are really based in rural area, to, to get some in-depth information, which is difficult for us to release here. And then you um, speak out or coverage on behalf of uh, the Burmese media and the ethnic media. So we would like to see there is more coverage on, on our situation and to work with the our ethnic and also our Burmese media. And, and another thing is like, um, you know, um, we, if, if you keep watching and monitoring the situation, uh, when the situation is getting like a, a bit out of control, then uh, for, from the perspective of the journalists, uh, maybe there should be some statements, some of the pressure, uh, and a letter to your own government saying not to oppress and not, not to oppress, you know, the Bami journalists and also like, uh, you know, the media freedom of expression to keep, to keep like, uh, you know, demanding for this. So that would be also very helpful. And also like um, other things like for technical assistance, of course, I also want to uh, endorse on this because like, um, you know, uh, we all are so new on every like uh, digital uh, uh, advances. So there are so many things that our journalists and media houses need to learn and to also like uh, how we can avoid any kind of like, uh, you know, digital threats coming from the government. And then so, so they need to learn like a digital security and to, to protect their data privacy uh, because there will be some hacking uh, and, and they start doing it also. Yeah, but those are also the very important. It's not not just a question raising about the activist safety because we all are like um, taking selfie and uh, in front of the you know demonstration and like that. I I believe that each and every one of them are really aware of the dangers coming to them, but they are so brave enough. But I would like to encourage not to take uh, self selfie anymore, and that to be more like uh, protective on our own security. Yeah, and also I think like uh, yeah, this this they need to be need to make more awareness to our how to say um, brave activists who are, who are on the streets, 
and also who are supporting as well. And also the last thing, uh, 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 I mean, like, um, you know, um, this, you know, journalists, they always face with threat and they always like, uh, how to say, uh, face with injuries because they have to, uh, because they are using phone, uh, very like an uh, old updated camera, you know, to have this live streaming and everything. So if they can have a bit like an advanced, uh, you know, um, camera or, you know, something that can, you know, take him from a bit farther and but can make it close up. If the international can consider to support that kind of things, that would really get close up and then good quality, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, footages. And, and that we can show to, you know, the world. And it can be also like a document for our history. And, and also like, so in, in trying to slow the connection as well. In that case, like you know, the media groups, including activists, they have to use international rooming SIM card. You know, like I, now we, we try to buy AI at the enemy, the communication cost is so big. So I think like if there are some support on that kind of things, I think the um, independent, small, uh, ethnic, local media organization can survive longer and can continue to monitor and then, you know, our coverage on the ground situation. So these are, that's all from, from me. Thank you so much, Tintinio. So better equipment um, besides tech support and um, support for communications. But Tintinio also makes a recommendation about personal safety for people who are engaged in the movement um, around selfies. And this is also a question that was raised by several of our audience. So we got quite a few questions which talked about um, about act, why are, are activists uh, taking precautions or why are they so brave um, to be out in open and social media? Um, and um, Titinio is saying, don't take so many selfies now, but um, I'm saying that if you have to take selfies can or, and go to these protests, please wear a mask anyway. Um, now, um, we've got in our chat box um, um, uh, contributions from Rachel Fleming and Michael Castor. Um, giving us um, um, uh, uh, links to digital resources, uh, including a guide in Burmese by the Mido ICT group um, and, um, and localization lab. So we do have a lot of information there. Um, Rachel and Michael, I'm going to also ask you a favor. Can you please put those uh, resources into the Facebook chat on the Facebook Live? Um, um, so um, uh, there's quite a few more questions, but I wanted to go to um, the sub panel, which is our list of reactors and commentators before we come back to these questions. So I'm now going to ask some very specific questions for a quick, quick reaction from um, other members of the ASEAN Coalition to Stop Digital Dictatorship. Um, firstly, uh, we have Damar Juniato, the executive director of SafeNet. Damar, um, welcome. Briefly, you've been listening for this to this very rich inputs and sharing from um, our very distinguished and exciting panelists. Um, uh, the organizations the, that observe this have reported that internet connectivity in Myanmar is 14% of pre-coup levels. Um, what is your reaction to what's happening now and what kind of solidarity or solutions can you offer? Over to you, Damar. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, first of all, uh, sending solidarity for uh, Asian people. So Debbie, uh, I will start to answer uh, actually in the Southeast Asia region, currently we are racing to the bottom, uh, racing to the digital di dictatorship. So what we can do to resist, what we can do to fight back. I think the first one, uh, let's raise ASEAN people solidarity, uh, gather people as many as you can in your countries, tell everyone when, what happening in uh, Myanmar and what uh, we should do. Uh, Indonesia has started this movement Hopefully others uh, will, will follow. 
uh, let, and the second one is uh, make a noise every day, uh, write down release, condemning the coup, the curfew, and also hit the kitchen tools at any time, um, probably at 6 p.m. right now in Jakarta, and, and share it to, the, uh, to other people. And the third one, let's mobilize help. Uh, uh, let's roll out training for digital security, sending tools for cir circumventing the digital curfew, start to learn how to uh, documenting the internet shutdown, that's the, the, the one that's missing uh, in our conversation, and de deploy fact checkers from Southeast Asia fact check uh, organization that's very also important. Uh, SafeNet and Asia Democracy Democracy Network has start uh, this kind of training, digital security training. Uh, let's do it again and again. As uh, Tinzar, Tintin Neo, uh, Dr. Matida, let's do it again. Uh, we will uh, happy to be uh, your trainers and we uh, let's stand up together again the digital dictatorship in Myanmar. The second thing uh, in ASEAN role. Uh, we already start our uh, countries to speak out. So today, Indonesia bring out uh, Myanmar issue to the ASEAN chair, Brunei. So it's, it's happening today. And then the second one uh, that we, we do is uh, we use the human rights mechanism. Uh, you know that every country in uh, ASEAN have ICER, uh, ASEAN representative. So ask your ICER representative to write recommendation and push uh, to, uh, to send human rights special envoy to enter Myanmar. This is uh, something that we can do, I think, and it's possible if we can do it uh, together. Uh, back to you, Debbie. Hopefully it's quite sure and answering. Oh, very rich and many, many, um, um, many, many um, uh, 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 suggestions and proposals, including Dama, you actually brought your pot to the webinar. <laughs> I'm impressed. Now, <laughs> Sophia, what are you bringing to the webinar? <laughs> are you bringing a pot too? Or do you have some ideas and proposals or solidarity? Over to you. Thank, thank you so much, Debbie. And um, my salute to all uh, Myanmar friends um, here, but especially to those who are on the ground right now. I'm really impressed. Indeed, I follow your, uh, I mean, Debbie uh, conversation on BBC the other day. I mean, at the beginning when the coup start out and the question from BBC um, journalist, he asked what international community should do. And your response was rightly illustrated to me now is that, you know, instead of directly saying that international community should do this or do that, but you, you said very inspiringly that, you know, um, people on the ground, the grassroots activists, the community expect this would be happening. So uh, people on the ground are ready and prepared. And, and to me, I was a bit shocked, um, but you know, uh, quickly I see people on the ground are protesting in a different form. And that statement remind me a lot that well, you know, the community on the ground are really prepared. And, and, and that's why, you know, I, I, I said earlier that my salute to you all and please keep fighting. And we are standing here together. Um, the Cambodian Civil Society have, um, you know, like uh, stand out together with me and my friend. Um, on the other day, we have uh, come to the Burmese embassy to call out our rejection to the military coup, as well as to send our message that we are standing with the Myanmar people who are fighting for the democratic space. And therefore, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I just try to listen, but I offer my thought um, with you all. And um, I believe that, you know, like speaking from the ASEAN community, <laughs> we, we're talking about the people to people cooperation or partnership, but the government also stress about the government to government partnership. And a um, few, um, not just few, but a number of ASEAN country uh, from the government's perspective, they repeatedly use the, um, you know, the non-interference um, uh, approach or, or, or principle saying that, and, and, and suggesting that um, the, um, the government, but also the people should not interfere to the in, into the Myanmar situation right now. I believe that the principle of um, non-interference is not ap ap 
uh, it's not applicable at the moment when the Myanmar friends is facing the real threat and 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 the threat that is also violating the ASEAN Charter itself. You know, the ASEAN um, Charter have emphasized that the respective country have to uphold the um, rule of law, the governance, um, you know, and, and people participation as well. So having a military coup is a slap against the ASEAN Charter and citing the non-interference uh, principle is, is also uh, not making sense and, and, and a violation to the ASEAN chapter, but as well as the ASEAN human rights declaration that all the ASEAN member have adopted. So in short, I just want to clearly appeal to all the ASEAN government, including the Cambrian government, although they keep denying that, you know, they, they maintain the non-interference um, uh, policy. I believe that as the ASEAN government, if we don't want to see a repeat military coup or the coup um, come to the power by force like that, we have to speak out from the government level, but also from the people, um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, power. So um, together, we are here with the Myanmar friend, and we hope that um, we believe that with people power and the support from across the world, um, the military coup will not be successful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia Pchak. That was Sophia Pchak, Executive Director of Cambodia Center for Human Rights. I've just received a message that Ko Sui Win is going to have to leave us a little early um, because he has some very important responsibilities. But uh, before you leave, Ko Sui Win, did you want to share um, or make any final remarks before you leave us today? Uh, sorry, yeah, I got to leave. So, you know, the message I want to give to all the friends, you know, in the Southeast Asia or in other parts of the world is that this coup is an affront, this is an assault, you know, to our conscience. This is an affront to everyone living in the 21st century, whether you live in Southeast Asia or, you know, in Africa or in the West, this is an assault to all of us. And also, uh, there should be no illusion that this coup is the, just the beginning, just the beginning of another era of decanals in, a, in our history. Uh, don't take, uh, you know, uh, any sort of uh, belief actually in the junta's uh, propaganda statements that you know they are going to impose one year uh, one year of uh, state of emergency and then they're going to hold free and fair elections so there should be no no uh, no illusion that you are you know about uh, uh, about about the uh, mischief you know mischief uh, which the Hunter has been uh, conducting that you all, you know? So I think the, particularly in the South Asian, you know, uh, countries, ASEAN, they should start changing their policy, you know? This is not just a coup of the military generals in Nepal, you know? This is just um, a further extension of China's geopolitical interests. You know, if we want to get the democracy in our country, we got to fight the Beijing. This is the message we got it. Without the approval or encouragement from the Chinese regime, no military general in Myanmar is in a position to launch a coup. Given the huge influence China has in many sectors. Uh, in our country, the influence or a number of strong ethnic angles, influence on the Bami's, uh, I mean, generous through joint economic projects uh, between Chinese company 
and the military-owned companies, etc. There is a lot of actually, you know, influence uh, from China, uh, which has been established over the past two decades. So without a green light from the Chinese government, there can be no good in Myanmar. So we are going to see a lot of Chinese projects uh, being implemented over the next over the next few months or few years as you worry. So uh, everybody should be mindful of this China's, you know, extension of power in the Southeast Asia country. It has already extended its influence as you worry, you know, in Cambodia and other uh, Southeast Asia countries as you worry, you know. So we got to, well, we got to understand the, ba the, the bomb is cool, not just, you know, uh, from from the perspective of the uh, you know uh, Bama, Bama's problem at you all you know but also from a greater you know uh, geopolitical uh, point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us, Kosway. When we are aware that you rarely you I don't think I think this is the first time you've spoken in public since the coup. Um, so thank you. This is a it's we really really appreciate. The time and um, and your candid uh, sharing, your very deeply personal sharing. Before you log off, I just want to say that we have had participant uh, audience um, sending solidarity messages from Thailand. Hello, sweetie, <laughs> from Thailand, from Malaysia, from Pakistan, from Norway, Scotland, France. Um, uh, and also Brazil and the US. So a lot of people around the world are sending everyone their solidarity, but also you, Kosovo. So thank you so much for joining us um, and um, hope to see you at another event very, very soon. And also, if you need, a, uh, if you need assist, any assistance to help you um, write, transcribe and write your articles, I, there are many volunteers lining up. So um, please don't deprive us of your writing. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us. And now I'm going to move on. Thank you. And now I'm going to move on to Raman Chima, the um, Access, um, Access Now Asia Policy Director. So Raman, I'm going to ask you something very much um, in your role, in your official role, Facebook has come under a lot of pressure, a lot of attention in the past few years, firstly, for um, their failure to address uh, fake news and hate speech and incitement against the Rohingya and other minorities in the country. And now um, with what's going on in terms of the internet shutdown and other pressures. So Raman, can you share with us what um, uh, the top lines of the Facebook response and what do you think are the pros and cons of Facebook response? Um, firstly, I want to say that uh, Manusha Foundation did actively pursue Facebook to participate and respond in this webinar, but um, they were very shy. So now, Raman, you are going to give us the analysis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. I can definitely give you my sense of it. I don't think I'll be able to explain what all they're doing because one of the challenges I think that the community has is we still don't know the extent of what all Facebook is actually doing. I can outline for those of you, the, those of you, those of the people joining this, you know, call or watching it live on Facebook Live, that what's been reported from Facebook very clearly is them saying that they would take down misinformation posted by the military coup government on their platforms. They would not provide a space for the military government to be, to be able to justify the coup as well as taking down um, a range of profiles and pages maintained by them. And that's where I myself would in fact love to hear from others on it on what they've seen because some of those pages seem to be from before the coup. For example, the, the military government's TV channels page on Facebook, which should have actually been taken down under their own the service previously, but seem to only have been observed and noticed in end January. Uh, but then other measures that they've said in terms of what is being taken down and whether it's um, 
uh, since our Matida or others, it'll be great to hear from them briefly. But what I can observe and notice is that Facebook and other platforms, they've said that they've taken action. And here are other platforms I refer not just to Facebook's properties, including WhatsApp and Instagram, but I'm also, of course, noting the fact that you know Google properties and video services are available in Myanmar, Twitter and other platforms are there. So of you who have uh, been following the coup closely know that, of course, several of these services have were blocked initially and blocked later and are still subject to occasional throttling. But the sort of clear categorical statement that I would love to see from these platforms is, A, of course, making clear about their understanding of where the military and government agencies now controlled by the junta government, what role uh, do, do they think that they have on their platforms in that are they completely taking them down or only taking them down when they believe targeted violence or incitement against protesters is being made because I know that's what our community wants to understand. I think our community also wants to have a clear categorical statement from all platforms that any cooperation with Myanmar authorities, any Myanmar authorities, because unfortunately at present right now, all of the authorities are being controlled or subverted by the junta, that any cooperation on user data or other surveillance requests is off the table. Uh, some of you may have seen that categorical statement from platforms after the Hong Kong national security law was passed um, and them saying that they would review cooperation. And that's a mechanism that many NGOs are still trying to make sure in the context of Hong Kong, they're holding true to. But for Myanmar as well, we need that categorical statement from the tech firms, including Facebook and others, that user data related requests and surveillance requests are off the table. They may or may not have cooperated with them earlier, but they need to issue a clear categorical statement that they will not do so. And attempts to pass the cybersecurity law or put provisions in the electronic transactions law or any other measures would be contested by them the strongest possible measures. I think it's also important for them to take a strong position that any user data requests from neighboring governments, including the government of Thailand and others that seem to be being used to target protesters or other activists who are in Myanmar will not be cooperated with or that they will enforce further human rights protections and checks on them. Because we know that that's exactly something that the junta government is actively doing. Uh, SIM cards, not just from Thailand and elsewhere, are a lifeline for many people. They're also a, a vulnerability, as many digital security people will warn you. So you are living slightly on borrowed time using them. But I think we need to put that pressure that companies and other actors put that pressure there. But lastly, not on tech companies, but just a brief mention on telecom companies. Access Now sees it very important that telecom services continue in Myanmar because they are a lifeline. But we do believe that if telecom companies operate in Myanmar, despite the sort of pressures, threats, and even perhaps hints of violence being made against their staff, they need to hold firm and say they will apply human rights and checks and practices as far as they can. And particularly of the big three telecom companies, uh, Telenor, as you know, has been very public, including on the fact that they cannot update anymore on what they are seeing in EMR. But we need that accountability and that, you know, that just that communication with civil society from Uridu and from uh, the Mitel, Vietel, uh, you know, conglomerate there as well. We need those answers and from all other companies that service these telecom companies, whether it be the National Electronic Corporations of, of Japan or other equipment manufacturers or US companies like Cisco, we need to know what they're doing and that they're taking these active measures. Uh, and lastly, and I know I've gone beyond the question about Facebook, but just to leave you this, that as governments are placing sanctions, we are very concerned, of course, that those sanctions do take, have impact to improve the human rights situation and not make it worse. So it's something very important that those who engage with governments and other countries pursuing sanction measures, not just the United States, but EU states, even pressure against Singapore and Japan, don't limit the ability of digital security tools and services for activists in Myanmar, because you've learned from the mistakes of Iran and elsewhere, where sanctions supposedly meant to help with human rights, of course, in a political context, ended up denying people of critical tools and facilities. But these are some of the observations I have, including on the obligations of firms right now. And if you're a firm doing business in Myanmar, even if you're under pressure, you better do a human rights assessment and an actual open conversation right now, not tomorrow, not next week, but within the next 24 hours, because we will hold you to account. Thank you, Raman. That is a very, very comprehensive warning to anyone, any company, including any tech company in any digital company in terms of their obligations. Raman's got his eye on you. Access Now is coming to get you if you don't follow the rules. Now, the thing is this, all these companies have to understand 
that they have obligations, international human rights obligations, including under the UN guiding principles for business and human rights, and also under the OECD guidelines for responsible business conduct. And, um, and we do need to remind those companies that they have an obligation to follow international human rights standards and not just descend to the lowest common denominator, which is the poor rule of law in Myanmar. I'm very, very inspired that even as people are speaking, our audience is sending a lot of information and a lot of helpful hints. Dharma has put on how to do a turbanize to to, uh, to uh, turbanize yourself so that you can um, express your solidarity with the civil disobedience movement in Myanmar. But also Rachel and other friends are continuing uh, to post helpful hints, including how to donate to Myanmar now, how to support BNI online, et cetera, et cetera. And also how to get daily news in brief in English on Pen, Pen Myanmar's um, Facebook page. Now, everyone who's posting here in the Zoom room, please copy and paste into the Facebook Live comments so that everybody else can see it. Um, um, thank you so much, Raman. And now we have in the last 30 minutes, there's a whole bunch of questions on here. And I wanted to um, um, uh, to, to share some of these questions. Um, a, a friend from, uh, for, oh, and also I forgot to mention, we have messages of solidarity from Germany. I think I missed out Germany when I called out all the different countries. Um, uh, one of our, one uh, participant, one audience member from London expressed concern about whether there would be repercussions on um, civil society organizations and activists who have had links or support from international organizations and asking for advice on how um, organizations overseas can um, prevent uh, repercussions on their partners on the ground in Burma. Does anyone have any ideas? Or uh, is this a big issue for you? Um, I'm going to ask uh, um, Matida and Tinza to answer that first, since they are the ones on the ground in country. Um, Dr. Matida and then Tinza, please. Oh, you now you have to unmute. <laughs> Hello. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I think the very first thing the Honda has been doing is the raiding the Dokken G Foundation, saying that it's receiving the fundings from the international community, something like that. So, right now, we are not yet very clear their intention, the real intention and real agenda behind it. Why just Dokken G Foundation? So, it's they are pretty tricky part of uh, receiving the uh, funding, but compared to the past experience, we already have uh, kind of the uh, freedom association law and most of the organization already being registered. For example, like Panama is registered, we have been accountable all the time until the Honda. <laughs> so I'm not sure. The, the, also Tokeni Foundation is the uh, registered foundation. So we are not sure if they really want to attack one organization, they can use that. So there, hopefully there are no more uh, new amendment on the Freedom Association law or something like that. But still, this kind of thing is very, very usual tactics for the hunter to attack organizations. Thank you. Uh, yes. You know, we are all back in all ages, all age, like back in old days, how we ran, how we operate ourselves back in before 2010, for example. Uh, for example, my organization located in Thailand before and we were underground and, and we moved back in Myanmar in 2013. We haven't registered yet. I think they were, they were I mean, the, the military uh, regime, they were likely to 
recognize the registered organizations, most of them. But it also depends on what types of work they do. If they do humanitarian work, if they do charity, all these things, likely that is okay for them. But if they do freedom of expression, human rights, you know, politics stuff, likely they will be targeted sooner or later. So we now have to think of a longer plan. Like, are we moving out again? To like, what in what way are we look are we uh you know locating our base our base in different areas like in previous time in in thailand in borders that's the that's a key question right now we are looking at the situations trying to map out you know what are the possibility and so on with the covid situation is clearly suffocating for all of us we are locked up here we are locked up by covid and now by coup so even to move to thailand thailand is under military dictatorship as well so where are we going to flee? And that's the, exactly um, the, the same question we are asking ourselves every day. So I think obviously it depends on what types of work you do. Um, even if you are linked, even our organization linked with Western organization, it depends on ex exactly what you are doing. Um, I think that's that's the answer for me. Thank you, Tinta. Um, it's a question that everyone is asking and they're finding their way around it and not having any big or long-term solutions. I think the most of your energies are focused on the civil disobedience movement and on uh, uh, overturning the school. Um, uh, there have been some questions on how to avoid fake news. What can local and international actors do? I think um, the fight against fake news trainings and workshops have been ongoing for the past few years, even before the coup, because of um, the uh, the the uh, fake news and incitement, hate speech against minorities in the country. So um, the the question now is how do we scale that up? Um, it, Tintin Yu, did you uh, and uh, and anybody else wanted to respond to that question? Uh, just a um, brief uh, how to say response. I think like uh, for all of us, you know. Um, in previous administrations, uh, because of the like a uh, high numbers of people using social media, and social media become a very popular platform. Fake news, hate speech are also like uh, one of the things that we have to go. Uh, we have to stay together with, and then also like that's why like uh, the the um, the importance of the media literacy become uh, a big role in in the in the country, including for the media houses, journalists, because like um, for us, especially these times, um, there are so many information going on on, on different uh, platform, including email, many things are sending out and a credit to credit to credit to, we don't know who is written. And sometimes if the thing that they have written, when we feel like, oh, that that we agree with, so we share. Uh, but uh, but they are always like uh, you know good and bad in consequences whatever uh, we we are sharing and spreading information you know there are always biases as well and so um, I think like what I can suggest this time is follow and they say uh, credible and uh, and say media organizations uh, we cannot always follow influential people because they are also biased. Uh, they can be, uh, they can, uh, they cannot always be true, you know, in this time, in this, in this time, especially. So that's why uh, if we want to get the news, uh, the true news, uh, follow the, uh, how do you say, media organization that is playing independent role in this time. And then don't believe any news from Yawadi MRTV. So that's what we can say, but we can still listen to what they are saying because we have to know what their strategies is, what kind of messages they are giving, so that we can counter those uh, information and then give the you know the real and also the reliable information that the people really need to know. So yeah. Thanks, Tintin. Um, there's another question which was. Um, about donations, how to ensure the money donated is not confiscated by the military um, and concerns that the banks are closed half the time now anyway. Um, I'm going to actually answer that. Um, Tinza Shunle said, we are going back 
to pre pre democratization pre transition set uh, uh, period in our strategies and our tactics because we are facing similar uh, similar challenges and that also means that how uh, resources are transferred uh, um, are also probably going back to the pre-2010 era. So anyone who wants to support to any of these organizations represented here in the webinar, please feel free to do so. The money will reach those who need it. Um, we are now in the last tw final 20 minutes of the session. Um, before I give everyone um, two minutes to wrap up, I would actually like to hand over the floor to our host, uh, Manusha Foundation, and um, to its executive director, Emily Pradichit, to do the usual promotion on um, the, the advertisement, this is your advertising break, um, the, uh, uh, a little bit of information to uh, help people know about the ASEAN Regional Coalition to Stop Digital Dictatorship and a little bit of information about our activities. Over to you. Thank you, Devi. Now I would like to sincerely thank all the, all the amazing speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone, for taking the time for being with us. Thank you, Tin Zara. Thank you, Tin Tin Neo. Thank you, Matida. Thank you, Kosi Win, who already left. But thank you also, Raman, Damar, Sophia, for also joining and giving your giving your input. And when it comes to ASEAN solidarity, I think the, the first thing, the best thing that we could do is actually to provide a space for all of you to be able to be heard. Because when the coup happened, we were all very worried for our friends and we were following what we, what what is happening on the ground. We're following the hashtag, what's happening in Myanmar. We're following all your twists in our, everything that BNI and Myanmar now was producing, was disseminating. But one thing that we wanted to do is actually to hear that really from you. And so that's why this, this webinar is really important for us because everybody is wondering what is happening? How can we help? How can we support you? Uh, what do you need from us? And so that's something that we hope we can do more regularly. Uh, that's something that we hope that we can provide a safe space for all of you to be able to speak and for people from all over the world to actually hear what you have to say. Because what is happening in Myanmar, as David said during the BBC uh, interview, but also as, as Kose Win said earlier during the webinar, is the coup, people on the ground already knew that it was happening. It's just that the international community was not listening. So again, this is testimony that People are only reacting when a coup is happening. It's the same thing that happened in Thailand in 2014. And what Kose Win said, I think, really also reflects to what is happening in ASEAN in general, the rise of dictatorship on the ground, but also the rise of dictatorship online. So that's why we launched this uh, ASEAN Regional Coalition to stop digital dictatorship. And what is happening is really a testimony of the increasing digital dictatorship that has taken place over the years. Uh, we were on the coup in Thailand, we are still on the military junta, uh, and there has been an increasing crackdown on activists online, and it's happening now in Myanmar. So this type of webinar for us is also a way to, to help you, because sometimes we don't know where to give the money, we don't know exactly what you need. So what we have been able to witness throughout the webinar is people from all over the world sharing information, sharing tools and knowledge with you guys. Uh, that's why they keep asking, please, everybody that is on uh, on Zoom and every Rachel and everyone, all of you that are sharing great, great tools from Mido already in Burmid, could you please also share them on the Facebook Live because the Facebook Live will stay, it's being recorded and everybody will be able to go back on the Facebook Live. And we will also be able to, to put the Zoom recording on our YouTube channel later on. But all the conversation that we have will stay on the Facebook Live. So please share as much um, as you can. And I would like to end by, uh, uh, by reflecting on what Kosewin said and what uh, Raman said, I think Raman said very uh, clearly that there's a need to hold companies accountable, not only social media platforms, but also tech companies, service, internet service providers. It's not normal for Telenor and Cisco to say they are unable to provide information on the actions and what is happening in Myanmar. As Raman said, they actually have 24 hours to provide a specific human rights response. And since they are committed to implement the UNGPs, they cannot hide behind uh, behind the fact that they don't know what to do. They should be able to know what to do because I'm sure they knew also that the coup was coming, like other people in Myanmar. And as Kosewin said, there's Chinese influence behind that. 
and people shouldn't live in the, in the illusion that there will be elections in the next year, because that's something that we witnessed in Thailand. When there was the coup in 2014, there was no election the year after. The military junta was lying, and the election only took place six years later. And even after the general election, we're still under a military-backed government. So um, truly, I think it's it's uh, this time is very, very important for us to keep building solidarity throughout the ASEAN. We, I don't have any hope uh, among ASEAN leaders, uh, among ASEAN head of states, because as you can see, the, the junta in Myanmar is seeking help from Thailand to restore democracy. So asking help from the worst, uh, you can only get the worst. So really it's, uh, it's all of us and people all around the world that would be able to build solidarity and, and keep sharing your information, keep sharing what is happening on the ground from you. And thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much to BNI and uh, Myanmar now for all the news that you're producing because thanks to you, we know what's happening. Thanks you, Tinzar and others. Thank you, Tinzar, for being at the front front on the ground, for your fears, for your courage. And as much as I want to tell you, protect yourself when you take selfies, at the same time, when you take selfies, I know where you are. So, <laughs> so it's also reassuring me that she's still alive. She's still on the ground. She's still fighting. So yeah, you're like young people in Thailand, you know, like they, they're on the ground. They have been taking selfies. They have been fighting back. And, and they have been also applying innovative and new tactics. And that's also what we're always mixing with the young people in Myanmar, you're very inspiring and keep inspiring all of us. So thank you so much for everything you do. Uh, Emily, you still have to say something about the next webinar. Yes, okay. So we have, we have our next webinar. So as the ASEAN Regional Coalition, we, we host webinars regularly. So this one was specific to Myanmar. We hope we'll be able to provide you a space to host more specific one on Myanmar based on what is happening on the ground. Otherwise we have one in two weeks on 18 March which will be on disinformation in Southeast Asia. So basically how uh, state-sponsored disinformation is actually a threat to democracy online and offline in Southeast Asia. And speakers will be amazing uh, people and amazing activists from the coalition, but also from the ground. And we hope also with youth uh, students and youth activists. So please join us also in two weeks for another great webinar with speakers at the front front of the human rights response. Thank you. You have done your duty. Now we are in the final 10 minutes of our webinar and I wanted to give everyone the freedom to say whatever they want for one minute. So I am going to start with, uh, with Tinza and then for one minute and then Dr. Matida and Tintinio and and then we'll go further down the list. So Tinza, you got one minute. Your time starts now. <laughs> okay. So I just wanna just wanna share you with my reflection. I always thought um, solidarity is really important, but I never thought solidarity is the key to everything. So now I realize because my people are now just separate that's separately looking for support, like a mental support and all the support, you know, whatever. Um, they are flooding the Twitter. It's so um, overwhelming at the same time. They migrated to Twitter within two days, like thousand people joining and they, they keep tweeting about safe Myanmar, safe Myanmar. I hope they are clearly, they, they will clearly understand why Rohingya people, why Korean people, why Kitchen people, they wanted solidarity so much from Burmese people before. So that's my uh, reflection. I wish um, this kind of crisis also gave us a, a clear reflection and, and to understand more about you know, who we are in the end. And I truly think this is a positive step for all of us to really start, um, go forward for a better future. So let's keep the faith and let's keep fighting. I think, yeah, I think our generation is bringing a real change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matida. Yes, I think yeah, I will follow the Raman's uh, saying. Uh, we do need the cooperation from not just from the telecommunication uh, sub telecommunication service provider, but also the tech companies. Right now, I think for the support supporting the civil disobedience movement, the role of the tech companies, which has been helping the army related businesses and the, the hunter based uh, 
government uh, procedures or the government web page it's it's pretty much important, you know. The cooperation from the tech companies is pretty much effective. That's why we do need that kind of the serious and effective support from these uh, companies. It's uh, very, very important. It's uh, uh, the international community can help us, I think. That can uh, make the leverage to the protest and the resistance. Otherwise, we will end up unimaginable uh, long-term dictatorship. So we truly do not need that kind of thing. This time, we cannot stay beyond this month, even this month. This should be the end of the uh, Honda. So please help us, and not just with the funding, but also with the technical assistance and the solidarity in spirits. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matida. Tintin Yu, one minute. Uh, thank you so much. Um, for me, it's like I always think that maybe there will be one time where our Burmese people can help others who are in need from the other part of the world. But again, we are always in need and we are always who have to act, support, solidarity uh, from the others. And then we have no time to talk about climate change. Now we have no time to afraid of the COVID-19. And then uh, we we just have to get rid of the mili military dictatorship again and again and again and again. So that is too much. So I think this time, that is the time that like um, we cannot just restore the previous and it's an elected government, but we have to abolish the 2008 constitution, which is uh, the biggest hindrance for all of us. And that is also like uh, where the power tank is for the military regime. So that's why we have to abolish this and then come up with a better solution, which is a federal democratic union that all the different ethnic groups and also like races can enjoy, you know, their individual rights or collective rights. So that's what I would like to say. And that's why the role of the media is also important. They have to continue reporting what the different ethnic groups are also saying, what are they demanding? Uh, are, are, they, are their demands different from the barmans? or the NLD supporter. If it is different, we have to come up with a solution. How are we going to make it one common goal? So that's my, my, my last message. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tintin Yu. Now, one minute in this order, Dama, and then after Dama, Sophia, please jump in, and then Raman. So go. Yeah, first of all, uh, I will repeat again about the importance of uh, to raise the Asian people's solidarity. So because we are not, not right now facing the um, digi digital dictatorship in Myanmar, it doesn't mean it's stopped there because it's also happening in other countries as well. But let's first uh, do this uh, together. Let's gather a lot of people uh, in your countries, tell everything what happening again in Myanmar and then we make a noise, a big noise, uh, and uh, we start from that. And then let's uh, think of uh, what we can uh, send uh, help to the people of Myanmar. Uh, a lot of resources uh, outside Myanmar right now. Uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, we have that, those resources. And then let's send, send them to, uh, to uh, Myanmar friends. Uh, Let's uh, share our knowledge also. Indonesia uh, has experienced internet shutdown and we know how to circumvent the internet shutdown, how to documenting the internet shutdown. We can help them to, to understand that this is something that we can fight together, not only for Myanmar people, but we can, uh, we, we, we can do it uh, together. And then the last thing, uh, let's stand up, stand up together uh, against digital dictatorship everywhere in uh, in the country. Thank you. My turn. Um, I believe that international community have the responsibility to ensure that, um, you know, this violent assault on the democracy um, in Myanmar is not successful and is prevented from going on um, any longer. Um, and therefore, ASEAN in particular uh, must answer the call for support coming from Burma and, you know, step in hell, um, one of its own in line with the ASEAN charter, as I, might, uh, as, as I have 
um, highlighted, you know, the ASEAN Charter have um, affirmed its association adherence to the principle of um, democracy, the rule of law, and good governance. So at such a die time um, um, that Myanmar democracy, um, you know, for, for Myanmar democracy and the stability um, in the region, uh, silent based on the argument of non-interference is unacceptable. You know, nothing sort of the immediate strong and uh, corrective action will do. And um, because what has been happening in Myanmar and also in Thailand nowadays, you know, it, it, it alert us as civil society elsewhere, including Cambodia, to take step um, to be ready um, to face challenge, you know, if it would be happening. Um, you know, many government um, have introduced a number of restrictive legislation as Cambodia um, in this few days we have just introduced the, um, you know, the uh, sub-degree on the establishment of national internet gateway is it's, it's similar to a five, um, China firewall. So it's just example how we have to be ready to, to, to st step up with any coming challenge ahead first. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I was going to say that what I think Damar and I also represent is to show that there can be hope even in digital repression and digital authoritarian steps happening in other countries. And that democracy always sees these fights. Democracy has to be fought for. And I think we're all committed Democrats in this region, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. If the Jakarta Administrative Court could rebuke their own government, even in a limited way last year for internet shutdowns, that's some progress. If internet shutdowns can be lifted in Jammu and Kashmir, which was tied with Rakhine and Chin for the longer shutdown, there can be some hope, even if it's too late. But more importantly, institutions, if they fail, it's the people. And it's the, it's the fact that every day what I see happening in Myanmar in terms of people on the ground protesting, organizing, sharing information that gives us that support that we are there to do whatever we can in terms of pressure on governments in the region, the Asian tech sector, global institutions to help put this pressure back. And I think there's an opportunity for us to ensure that the internet in Myanmar can, um, in a sense, uh, I say I would say do good for what harm it did earlier. And if the internet was used to target the Rohingya and other minorities, that we can use the internet today to be able to ensure that dem democratic rights are protected for. But we'll have to fight for that. It is going to be tricky. We're all there to support people in Myanmar as they would like and in whatever way they want us to do so. And I hope my organization and others here can do that help in policy, in digital security and campaigning. And as you said earlier, we are monitoring for those who cooperate. And as the UN Special Rapporteur on Myanmar said, for those who right now conduct atrocity, they will be a reckoning. Whether you're in Myanmar or in the region or globally, we are, what, we are watching and there will be consequences. Thank you, Raman. Thank you, everybody who joined us. Thank you to all our panelists. I'm thanking you on behalf of Emily uh, and Manusia Foundation and Alti and Verma. Thank you to all the participants who came in from also from Manipur, India, and from all around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. The lesson is we all have a role to amplify the voices of our friends on the ground in Myanmar as they struggle against this military junta. And the struggle is not only against the military junta, it's a struggle to abolish an, an unjust constitution. It's a struggle to change the institutions and the very nature of the country itself so that it is an inclusive democracy and inclusive society, inclusion on the basis of ethnicity, gender, religion, and belief, even location, whether you're a rural or, or urban person, on the whether you're poor or, 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 or rich or young or old, or on the basis of your gender identity or your political belief. This is the modern Myanmar that everyone is working for. And we have all of us, whether we are in the country or outside the country, solidarity is key to deprive this military junta of the means it has to continue oppressing the people. And the solidarity is key to keep on, keep the flame alive, keep on supporting our friends in Myanmar so that they know they are not alone. Thank you everyone for joining. We've come to the end of two 
very absorbing, very moving and very interesting hours. And I am going to have to log off and watch the Facebook Live again to truly appreciate what everyone said. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions from the audience. Thank you again, everybody. Stay safe, stay strong, don't give up. Bye-bye and don't forget. Thank you.